right there. Hi everyone, good afternoon. What an amazing day, isn't it? My goodness, glorious weather outside. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful day to be here. Um, so welcome to ADP's fourth annual HR Question Time. My name is Nicole Bello, and I'm going to be the host or moderator for this afternoon's event. Um, so what I'd like to do is welcome our panelists. We've got um, some leading HR practitioners that are here with us today. They're going to share their thoughts and their opinions on a lot of hot topics in the HR world as it pertains to technology and human resources. So without further ado, I'd like for you to please start off and give yourself a nice introduction to the crowd if you would. Tim? Hi everyone. Welcome to what appears to be the ADP speakeasy. <laughs> Knock twice on the brown door and ask for Nicole. You know, it's sort of that, that kind of um, and they let you in. And they let you in, yeah. lovely, <laughs> after, a, after a small pause. Um, my name is Tim Pointer. I am a consulting HR director. So I was been HR director of brands like uh, Diesel and uh, Jim Beam and Lacoste, Ted Baker, um, uh, Berghaus, those kind of good things. Um, and then for the last uh, two years ago, I set up a consultancy called Starboard Thinking. Um, I understand we are. we doing some tweeting as we go? I hope so. Bit We've of got our hashtags on the wall. Fantastic. So I'm um, at Tim Pointer, if that helps uh, uh, along the way. And I work with a, a range of brands uh, across uh, everything these days, from professional services to um, uh, NHS and uh, many good brands along the way. Um, and I'm fascinated by organizational culture and how it enables organizational high performance. Thanks. Welcome. Thank you. globally, Clo Global had, I always like to trip over that, for uh, the employment group at Squire Patton Boggs, which is the, the name that you're never going to forget because it's called Boggs. And um, I, I lead about 170 lawyers globally. Um, but what I also do is I manage and work with clients globally. So what I think is really interesting for me about this, this white paper, as I call it, is being able to look at trends that come through not only from the UK but for the rest of Europe and really how much it, it kind of aligns with the experiences that we've had with our clients who are who are basically particularly clients who are faced with the, with the, the gig economy at the moment and we've been involved um, on the on cases involving, involving the gig economy, we're involved in one of the big cases in the gig economy, and we've also uh, inputted into the uh, government's um, Taylor review on that. So for us, for me, it's kind of you know a really interesting area, the whole white paper, but also in particular the uh, the gig economy. So it's going to be exciting. Thank you. So, uh, so I'm Perry Timms, I'm an independent practitioner, which kind of makes me a giger, I suppose. But um, uh, yeah, so my, my, my background is in the public sector and in the not-for-profit sector, where I worked on technology projects that were bringing about change in organisations. I wasn't a technologist, but I was helping with things like user specification and testing and then training people. But it was the training people where technology and people kind of intersected that really, really interest me and brought me to life. So I did lots of um, traditional learning and development stuff in the civil service and then in the not-for-profit sector. And then five years ago thought I'll give this gig thing a go. Um, really what I stand for I guess is helping people to create a more fulfilling life through their work and so I'm really interested in what I describe as next stage organisations. That's companies who break rules, challenge orthodoxies and bring people's kind of whole soul into the work that they do and those companies do exist, they are economically viable uh, and those are the kind of companies I like to champion and try and help people work with. Most of the stuff I do is working with HR teams who want to get at least a dollop of that inside their organisation but let's just say it's a tough game out there at the moment so um, recognising the challenges we've got but yeah I'm interested in technology but I'm not quite that geeky. Hey so uh, my name is Kevin Blair, I'm uh, one of the global heads of recruitment at Cisco uh, so what I really look after at Cisco, I'm sure you all probably know, Cisco Systems, uh, the technologists, infrastructure, networking technology, that kind of stuff, and then more recently collaboration products. Uh, so I have a fairly unusual role. I actually have a head office role, but I'm based out of the UK. Um, so I look after everything we do in EMEA from a hiring perspective. So um, everything from uh, our graduate entry through to our uh, executive hiring, I have, I have oversight for. Uh, everything in APJC the same. And then about 18 months ago, they asked me to take engineering hiring in the US 
which for anybody that's been in and around Silicon Valley or aware of what the current climate is like, there is a huge demand for talent and there is nowhere near enough talent to service it. Obviously, Donald Trump is making that very easy for us by removing the H-1B visa requirements and making it incredibly difficult for us to import talent. Um, but from our perspective, um, you know, I guess in, in, in a different way, um, I, have a, I have an end user responsibility. So I have an accountability as opposed to a concept or a service. Um, I, uh, I start the year looking down the wrong end of about 10,000 hires that we need to make. Um, and, uh, and setting a strategy that fulfills that uh, across about 120 different countries. So I have, a, I have 150 recruiters in 42 countries uh, that will report into me um, that we're required to service that. So I have this, uh, this difficult challenge around technology of, uh, well, a couple of difficult challenges around technology. One is around the fact that I need to fulfill the demand. So I have everything I do has to be whilst running as fast as I can possibly run. And the other thing is my, my, my uh, my thought process is, is very much around the humanistic elements of HR and, and recruitment. So therefore, I am sometimes can be a technology cynic um, in terms of like making sure that we continually balance, like how does it, it doesn't just drive productivity, that's great, that if, it, you know, if it's a budgetary decision, it drives productivity, but how does it drive the experience as well? How does it, how does it look and feel and how does it, uh, how does it drive a, an overall um, ex engagement, I guess, from a, from a hiring manager and from a candidate? Thanks, Kevin. Yep, look forward to talking about that a little bit further. Um, so just so everyone's aware, the workforce view, I think you got a copy of it on your chair. This is going to be underpinning a lot of our conversation today. So if you're not familiar with um, this, you'll see that we've interviewed 10,000 different employees across eight different countries, um, both genders, all ages. So this is really a good pulse or a good feel as to what the workforce is thinking. So I encourage you to take a look at it, but you're going to hear us refer to it throughout the day. Um, the other thing that we're going to be talking a lot about is the technology side of things. We already mentioned that. And, and the speed of technology is just insane, isn't it? I mean, every time you look around, there's new innovation, there's new ideas, and there's something more to figure out. So we're going to talk more about that and how we can maximize that. Because no matter what happens when it comes to technology and the speed in which it changes, we still need to focus on one very important thing, and that's the people, right? So our first topic is going to be for you, Perry. So this one's for you. Get ready. Thank you. Um, yep. So according to the workforce view, it says that the employees feel, 41% of the employees feel that they're going to be needing some type of device training in the near future. And then furthermore, 37% of the employees feel like they're going to need some advanced IT training. So what do you think over the next 10 years? What should the employees expect? Yeah, and so, how do we so I think it's that? great that you've been able to distill that amongst a range of things in that white paper to bring it to people's attention. Because I'll start from the point that as, as an, uh, almost like as an entity, I'd like to sort of apologize for HR uh, for not giving people enough digital credentials, digital skill. So I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So, so my dad's got a pretty nice Citroen Zara car, uh, Citroen uh, C4 uh, car, uh, and in it is a load of technology that the poor guy who's 77 and blessing me tries cannot use. And I look at workplace technology and I think there's a similarity to that. There's a whole brilliant range of technological capability that people in the workplace aren't using, partly because we haven't let them discover that, we haven't let them play with that and learn how to do that. They're frightened about what that means to the success of their role and their job and whether they break the system or whatever it is. And, and the stuff we've boxed up for them to help them with that technological sort of intervention um, hasn't been good enough. So, you know, when I started earlier, I talked about my route to it. Uh, it being HR has come through being on technology projects. It was my job to take a brand new system and help people understand what happened before now looks like this and operates like this. This was on very basic keyboard entry type stuff. Amplify that now by chatbots and artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let me give you another relevant example. So if you use Gmail on an app on your device, you may have noticed that when you open up a message, you have three already pre-prepared options at the bottom of the mail that you could just hit and hit send so that you don't have to type in a response. Now, if I was freaked out about technology, I would think, how does it know what I want to say? Has it read my thoughts? Has 
the occasional um, voice command activation when I haven't activated it actually been listening to me? Because if you listen to the world of technology out there, we're all frightened about the fact that our Alexa devices are recording us all the time that they're on. And actually Amazon themselves will say, there is a tiny period of time when you're not even talking to Alexa where we might record what you're saying just in case that's something that Alexa needs to know for content. I'm thinking, yeah, right. That's linking to a purchasing decision potentially. Uh, well, but there's people out there now frightened and suspicious and, and 1984 is probably selling really well for a reason that we're in a scrutinised society. So you imagine people in the workplace who have to use work workplace technology and they've got their own technology with them as well. Some of them are accessing work related technology on their own device. We're, we're hoping that they're the front line of our security defence. They may not even realise they're potentially the front line on our data security defence. But if they leave their phone unlocked and it has access to some of our sensitive corporate information, we would point at them and go, you did wrong, that's not fair, there's the door. When actually they didn't even realise there were protocols they could enable on their device, that there's a way of routing through a secure mechanism, because they don't understand what secure socket layers are, they don't understand what multiple levels of password protection will give them. And, and, and then we expect when we plug in virtual reality and augmented reality and robotic assistants that people are just going to go, oh great, some more technology I can play. No, they're not at all. They're going to be terrified about the fact that this is an overwhelming position to be in. So that's the apology and the kind of context piece. What do we need to do as HR practitioners? Well, for a start, we need to fess up if we don't understand it either. Because if we're supposed to create the covenants of protection, the guidance, the logistics, the support, the help, the counselling even, as well as the skills, we probably need to say, we don't know it very well either. Can somebody help us understand this better? So I think we need to make lots of friends with people who understand data security, the ethics and morality of what what data is being shared about you within the workplace and without the workplace and how it's used in a customer service sense and how it's used in a big data and analytics sense and how it's used in a machine learning and maybe even quantum computing sense. And I saw a, a talk yesterday on stage by a guy from Deutsche Telekom and what Deutsche Telekom have done is they've parachuted in some technologists to their HR team because they're recognising that the consumer facing guys are all over it. They're building this stuff and they love it but the HR people who are trying to get into the sales team and the leadership team to make decisions about this technology don't know it to that degree. So I think we've got a big gap to bridge between the technological innovators who are building some amazing technology and HR people who have got to convert that into workplace practice and safe and secure and ethical control of the things that we, we have at our disposal. So I'll leave you with a phrase, uh, Nicole, if, if I might there. And the phrase is that we're being led into the future by leaders who don't understand technology and technologists who don't understand the world. I'll just leave you with that. Thank you, well said. Carolyn, from an employee law perspective, what are your thoughts on? You can always rely on the cynical lawyer, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. the yeah. point is we, are, you know, we, we, have an, we have an aging workforce and people feel that they, you know, the, the, the retirement age is gone, people have to work longer because all the good things we did in terms of paying into pensions are not proving the dividends, hence why actually people are going into the gig economy. But anyway, so we've got this challenge where we've got an ageing workforce and I, so for two things for me, which is it's the perception that the business may have about certain people of certain ages being able to actually have that learning and decisions being made about those individuals. And on the basis, you know, if they're exited, then you've got liability coming out through age discrimination. So I think it's very much a tailored approach in the sense of don't assume what people can and can't learn. My dad is 77 and he knows damn sight more about technology than, than me, who's like 20 odd years younger than he is. So I think that is, you know, that is a point. I think picking up on the scary bit as well, you know, it's getting people comfortable with it so it's not it's actuality rather than than perception and it's a tailored approach to to individual needs yeah. and and getting the, it to the right place about technology you should introduce each other's dads because yours could probably help his yeah. dad with his car yeah. so right. no, my dad is great at that sort of yeah. thing he reached this pinnacle of his so, career so, solution and problems outside so, of the yeah. room yeah. you know so. but like but I, talk, help me. I taught my dad to text so he does that with me but his car honestly perplexes him oh, wait, but, 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 no, and it's such a shame him. i can't even drive it <laughs> but when it's when it's easy we we pick it up okay so if you take the example of um you know uh, 
tax returns, right? Last, last year, 48 million Americans completed their own tax returns. Now that's work that a tax specialist used to, uh, used to do. Mm. Um, how many people are in the room have used eBay? Yeah, Can't just be me, oh okay, right? So, and occasionally it doesn't work and there's a, di a dispute that needs to be worked out, yeah? So, so there's the online resolution program. 60 million people last year resolved their own disputes by, by using that. So when it's simple, when it's there and it's intuitive, mm. we pick it up. Our issue is that so often what we find intuitive and enabling at home, we come into the workplace and we then go, can I just go and get my laptop out of my car? Because it's like the stuff, I've got stuff on there which enables us to be more productive in, in here. And to, to build on one point that Perry, uh, Perry raised, there's, um, uh, it's called crystalnose.com, right? Go on Crystal Nose and uh, you'll find out that there is already a profile on you based on all of your social media activity and your online persona wow. which will advise someone how to be, how to bespoke their email to you now you may choose to engage with that and give it more information you may not but that is there whether you whether you want it to exist or not so not just the this you may want to reply on one of these three ways but you might want to to uh, approach this a person based on the, our view of their personality type this stuff is happening without your permission all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the next topic, if that's okay. Yep. So the next topic, as you would see probably on the sheets in front of you, is the gig economy. So there are so many people that are trending in this direction. If you look at the workforce view, I think it's about, what, 36 or 37 percent of the folks are thinking of going and becoming a contractor or a freelancer. I mean, this is kind of the, the wave of the future, it seems, for millennials. Obviously, this is because of technology. This is because of the freedom that it coincides with. But what are your thoughts on that, Caroline? Um, well, I mean, I think, further. yeah, I yeah. mean, Workforce View absolutely um, supports what we're finding as employment lawyers across Europe and, and that actually how things operate differently in Europe. Um, in the UK, you know, I, we were involved in the, in the uh, biz, that's an awful word, isn't it, consultation on zero hours. And, and basically what it said was that England used to be a nation of shopkeepers and now we're a nation of entrepreneurs. So I think that need, that desire by people in Britain to have control of what they do, when and how, has basically continued. And I think economics have played into that, where, you know, the biggest recession since the 19th, 1920s back in 2007 and, and we have struggled through the economy. Uh, the millennials are seeing parents who've done all the right things in terms of long-term savings not working and they're basically saying to themselves, right, grad schemes have gone, su succession isn't happening because people are staying in the business, businesses are reorganising so we're going to take control of our lives and we're going to set up. So freelancing in my lawyer narrow perspective is all about genuinely having control to do what you want when you want and how you want in subject to an overall structure within the business in which you work. But I also see that economics have been about the millennials taking control and setting up business in the bedrooms, in the house of their parents where they are to, because they can't get a job. And I think technology has supported that. Uh, we work, I don't know whether you've heard of, well, of course you have. We work is the largest freehold owner of property in New York. It leases out more property and that is a, 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 an umbrella for supporting entrepreneurs. So in that true sense, freelancers has really grown. And you see it in Europe as well. And it's, it, you've got a split Europe, actually. You've got um, the Netherlands and um, Spain, again, being very much like the UK. And again, in, in those countries, economics have supported it. And they've also got a structure like the UK, where it's actually relatively easy for you to set up from a tax perspective, UK we've got IR35 um, and uh, Netherlands and Spain you've got a similar sort of routine from a tax perspective. Um, so you can provide services to your end user without them being at risk from both a tax and a, an employment perspective. Whereas in Germany and France it's kind of, ooh, don't do that. Germans hate freelancing. They're basically saying this is about status, this is about um, us. If, we, we, if we're great at what we do we want to be a permanent employee. So. That's quite interesting, and in fact, the Germans have tried to get rid of the freelance concept. Um, Angela, Angela Merkel's um, party basically tried to pass a paper, uh, a law that did that, but it didn't get through. The French, 
Uh, is there anyone French here? I mean, the French are the French, which is, you know, we do not do this. Um, so, I, sorry, Nicole's uh, <laughs> husband. Um, so I think we've got that. And I think from a, so I think from a kind of, we can max out our money now. Um, because basically the, the end users can pay us more because they haven't got the pensions, they haven't got the insurance benefits, they haven't got that complicated issue going on. So we're getting the money now and we can choose when to work and, and what to do with our money because our parents or our grandparents it hasn't done any, any good for. The thing that I'm now being a bit of a lawyer is, is, is there a difference between being truly freelancer and being in the gig economy? Mm. The gig economy is, you know, what we think of gig, or what I tend to think of as gig is Deliveroo and Uber. And clearly, you know, I can understand exactly why that has arisen. You know, the need to have better logistics and more efficient logistics, the need to have better the way you deliver food and all those sorts of things. Absolutely right. But it is aimed at the lower end of the earning earning potential. This is not about the Rolling Stones and their gigs. This is about you sell how old I am, don't you? Um, but this is about those people and as you will see uber have been sued the delivery have been sued we're involved in another case involving another logistics provider where they're being sued as well and this concept of is is being in this economy this gig economy where literally you are doing short-term assignments you can choose whether or not to take the assignment you don't you can have work for as many people as you like so really completely not the master and servant on which this UK economy is based and employment law is based but still that that pressure are you really free to do what you like when you like because you're kind of bound in through that through that relationship so the, as you will see in the press I think delivery were in the press again today um, there is a lot of publicity around it and Matthew Taylor has been brought in by the government to look at it and his starting point is stop we don't want the exploited individual so you can see where that's going the manifestos that are coming through from the from the Tories and from the Lib Dems and from the Labour is give workers more rights so it's that kind of that ultimate flexibility for people to choose how they contract with whoever they provide services to is, is going to be under, under, under increasing scrutiny. We are, in, interesting fact, we are the 30th out of 33 OECD companies, c countries in terms of protection mechanisms for our employees. And we Brexited because we didn't want to be part of all of that. Those that voted, you can tell where I've come from, um, voted, voted to go out. But yet the talk is now about giving those people in the gig economy, those people which you see all the surveys actually embrace it, not being exploited or abused. So I think, are we going to end up being a mini Europe, which we Brexited out of? Some would say, other people say, is it anti-competitive? So I think we're in, we're in very interesting times. Our employment law in the UK is not in many ways fit for the gig economy, but what do we put in its place? So my interesting piece is, I know he's got something to say about it, um, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, if we're going, we have to do something which is balanced. We have to support choice. Um, do we legislate? Do we do a code of conduct? So, of course, I'm a lawyer, so I'm getting super excited about that sort of thing. Um, but it's that balance, isn't it? Choice versus repression. Just, uh, sorry, just ask a question, I guess. Sorry, yeah, to, sorry, I know Perry's got a comment to make. Just, so the, the companies you cited, I would, so Uber, Deliveroo, and then if you add to that Airbnb and companies like Shipley, don't make anything, don't own any yeah. capital uh, ex expenditure or anything like that in, in terms of property or anything. So you would argue they've created an entire market space that didn't exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's understandable that legislation is behind that curve. So what's preventing, in your opinion, our ability to react as a, as a, as a, as a country or as a legislative body to, to, see, to identify this is not about a company, this is not about delivery, this is about people who are self-employed, who have, you know, are not individually tied to, a, to an organization in, in a traditional structure, yeah. um, but equally is it may also be a lifestyle choice, so then forcing legislation through that may impact their ability to own those companies may be a negative. I mean, what, what are the prohibiting factors? Do you I, think? I think ultimately it's a cultural issue. Um, I think we are founded on master and servant. We may have got rid of slavery, 150 odd years ago, whatever, but we're still culturally, that's how we fit. Mm -hmm. And I think if you looked at employment law before, what delivery and Uber and the rest have done, it still wasn't fit for purpose then to reflect where, where, we're, where we're going. So I, think, um, so I think it's a culture which goes against it. And it's, it's basically, are we ready to shift 
Um, we should have been shifting, 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 but we're at the measure of the, the, the politicians, really. So I think, yeah, how do you shift that culture? Um, culture and, and bureaucracy. It's bureaucracy, because that's the other thing, because whatever legislation, legislation, we, our lawyers spend all their time going, it's crap legislation. Sorry, it's not very good legislation. And so, and then you become into litigation, which lawyers love. I feel like a moderator all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's so, no, bring it on. So, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about a personal story and then I'll talk about an ethos that I think we're, we're talking about here. So my, the personal story is whenever I talk to an Uber driver, I say, how is it? And they tell me how it is. Nobody's told me it's rubbish. Nobody's told me they're oppressed. People say, you have to work hard because the rates are pretty low. But when you're a student, that's better than bar work, apparently. Uh, when you're a parent, it means you see your children more, apparently. Uh, when you've got no choice, uh, it was a brilliant option compared to drawing down on benefits, which you'd never done in your life, you didn't want to do. So, so you know, I don't want to overplay the romanticism about it. I'm yet to speak to one who tells me they don't enjoy it and they'd rather be doing something else. They've got people running side businesses, all sorts of things going on. So it comes back to choice, as you said. Um, Recognising the legislation isn't quite there yet, and I know why that is, because I've read up on the kind of history of the kind of, whole kind of master-servant relationship. In the past, and going back as far as Greek mythology and history, if you wanted to, uh, we were either a merchant, a soldier, or a sage. We were either a merchant, a soldier, or a sage. And you can map every job that's out there to one of those three. If you're an administrator and in a learning de development team, you were probably a merchant because you're transacting something and you're arranging something. There's a new breed now, it's called networker. And they don't fit any of those three categories. And that's why legislation's out of kilter. That's why people potentially can exploit it. That's why culturally, as, as countries, we're not ready for it. It's a totally new mindset, totally new way of wiring your life. So I admire the fact that we want to bring protective measures in for people because uh, you know when people get lots and lots of money they do all sorts of very distorted things about the people who've helped them make lots and lots of money so let's keep that balance there but we are dealing with a totally new breed that's how I think we need to look at it a new breed and just one point on that which is there's always a constant conversation about how we um, how we should assess performance what's really interesting about the uber example is that they assess you yeah Mm. So, you know, you go into your app and you can look at how you've been scored as a passenger. Yeah. And then the Uber drivers will decide whether they pick you up yeah, or not, right. because they've got three rides going at the same time, mm. based on the score that the other Uber drivers have given you, as to whether you're courteous and clear as to where you want to go, and, you know, etc, etc, etc. So we've got this constant broader, um, broader commentary of scoring, and, and you know, that's true across everything that we're talking about. We're constantly giving feedback, collating feedback and making purchasing decisions on that scoring. I'm 4.7, by the way. Only 4.7? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why that is. <laughs> never, never. I've never disrespected any, anyone. OK, I'm going to move us along to the next topic, if that's OK. Um, so Kevin, this one's for you. So the stats would show, according to CEB, that over the past five years, it's taking 50% longer to hire the right person for a role, or hire a person for the role. So I guess the question for you is, you know, what can technology do, or what could technology do to get larger pools of qualified candidates? Sure, okay. No, it, and it is, I mean, we definitely feel that as heads of recruitment, um, and I meet with a lot of my peers, uh, both here in the US and in Asia, um, where we, we talk about this frequently. And, you know, we've definitely seen a stretch out of, the, um, of, the, of, of our time to fill, if you like. It's, it, it's the number one uh, KPI metric that we have in our scorecard as a team. So we measure 23 different things. We have nine core metrics, um, and it's the number one. Um, what's interesting is you, you use the word about the right candidate, um, and then you corrected yourself. Um, but it probably is the right candidate, and that's possibly why it's been pushed out, because I'm glad, and in some ways I'm glad, because it means the companies are still being thoughtful about the talent that they're hiring. Yeah. So in some ways you could look at it and say, well, they're still getting to the hire, it's just how much provision are they making within that? And then you start to think about, well, if it's going to take, um, if it's going, if it's going to take a, a, a longer amount of time, how can you then start to get in front of that? Um, so the, the first way to look at it would be uh, around the, around your selection processes. Um, and so we'll, we'll get to the, the kind of the actual process and the experience in a second. But I mean, one of the things that we did when we looked to solve a similar thing, because we, you know, technology, particularly engineering, hiring, and particularly in the U.S. 
um, is, is a real challenge. And it, it, it's, you know, I've been in recruitment uh, nearly 19 years. Um, I've only ever done recruitment and it's, it's the toughest challenge, toughest job I've ever faced was, was, was when I took over this team and, and establishing this. Um, and one of the things that we, um, that, that, that we looked at is what can we borrow from other parts, other, other parts of um, our organization? Like how do, how do sales stay in front of the, um, the, the, the revenue? Because uh, they don't, it's not just, you know, it's not just a moment in time thing, they happen to stumble on opportunity. So how can we think about how do we, how do we engage with people and how do we stay connected to them? Everybody who does my job knows that the ATS is where you, where you live. Like everything goes into the ATS. It's your, it's your applicant tracking system. It's the, it's the, uh, the, uh, the, the source of truth in, in, in all the hiring. Um, and what we, what we did is ATS is uh, fantastic, but what, what we're missing is that, that what we were identified is actually that's when we, we, we know that they're an applicant. So that's when we can start to manage them through. So if we want to reduce our, our time to fill, how do, we, how do we reduce the, the, the time it takes to identify a candidate and engage with them? So what we looked at in, and what we implemented was a CRM. So similar to what the sales uh, organization use in the marketing organization, where they run leads. So I would never want to kind of just refer to a candidate as, as a lead or, or an opportunity. But what they are is they're an opportunity for a hire. And so what we did is we were able to say, okay, well, not everybody wants to join us now, and we don't want to hire everybody right now. You know, my you know, 10,000 fills a year is spread out over, over 12 months. Um, and so what we wanted to do is, is, is create a warm sentiment with those individuals. And so, so by using CRM, which is a non-traditional piece of recruitment technology, we were able to have a continual dialogue with, uh, with candidates. So that when they go into a meeting and when they, get, you know, when, when they get balled out by the boss and they come out and they've had an email pushed to them by, uh, by uh, Cisco, by the CRM, and says, hey, listen, we thought this might be interesting news for you. This is what we're doing. Oh, and by the way, we're hiring. It's that moment in time that you want to capture them. The second thing is when you do reach out to them, when you do have a role and you are being proactive, if you've had a continual dialogue with them and you're, you're, understanding, you're following their career and you understand what's happening with them, then they're, they're probably more likely to engage. As you then start to put them through the process, it's, it's, that, it's that balance between, you know, the, 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 what we, one of the things we've noticed is even though our time to fill has stretched and where it's stretched even beyond our target, our satisfaction has gone up. So the overall hiring manager and candidate satisfaction has actually increased the longer the process has took. Now I can tell you that is nothing to do with the hiring manager being happy that they've had a role open for longer than they'd hoped. But what it probably means is we, they, that there's been a better hiring experience because it's been more thoughtful. Now you don't want to take that away. You don't want to take that experience away from either the candidate or the hiring manager, but it's a difficult market. So what we then started to think about is where can we have opportunities to really um, compress, compress the, 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 the process. So AI's been mentioned a couple of times while I've been on stage. So we, uh, we love pilots in Cisco, like we pilot every, like everything goes as a pilot, like because it gives us the opportunity to run really fast. And then you can maybe dance around some of the systems requirements if you're going for a full implementation. So we, we do a lot of pilots. And one of the things we, we, we looked at, I went to, to a conversation with a, a, a technology company that, that's at the same scale as Cisco. And the, the head of recruitment was talking about wanting to, to put AI all the way through the recruitment process and fully automate the recruitment process and digitize it. And I'm kind of sat there thinking, well, that's great if you're Facebook. Because if there's been an article pick, pick, uh, put on LinkedIn today and it, it's worth digging out if you can go and find it. Facebook are winning the, the, the war for talent against the, the like companies, so like Google, like um, Stripe, like all these other like kind of cooler technology companies, if you like, and, and, and more embryonic ones. They're actually fulfilling everything the, the, in terms of volume and, and, and their quality. And so if you're getting that many applicants, you probably can automate a large part of it. But I'm sat there with a company we compete with and their head of recruitment. I'm kind of rubbing my hands a little bit thinking, well, if you're going to automate it, that means my recruiters who understand that that candidate's having a bad day or that candidate's partner is ill and, and, and that, that whole ability to have the psychology of the recruitment process is going to be lost. However, there are parts of the process that we, we really can automate in, term, in, in terms of accelerating it. So look, some of the things that we, we, we're looking at is the idea of, of stack ranking um, candidates in terms of the applicants. We get, sometimes we get thousands of applicants um, to, to, a, uh, to, to a role. And a lot of them aren't, uh, you know, infrastructure architects. A lot of them work in a gas station, a petrol station, or a convenience store, right? But they want to do that job, so they apply. Now, my, my recruiters would typically have to view those applications and then make a decision. Obviously, it's like a no, it's a no, it's a no. Um, but looking at technology where it, it, it creates a shortlist, and it's an interesting dynamic, and the, the lawyers um, love this, is because then how do you legislate for the fact that, that it's, it's not discriminating? How, how, can you, how can you knock out the bias? 
right? The fact that you may want a, a conscious or an unconscious bias through the process. So how, how do you legislate for that? You then go through the process. And one of the things that we did where it's, it's a good example of technology impact in uh, a speed to hire. So one of the things we're always nervous about, when you identify the candidate you want, the candidate's gonna have competing offers. Like it's a big problem, like you're really, ner like you're, nobody, once the recruiters put an offer to a candidate and the candidate's accepted, you never really wanna see that candidate's name come up on your phone again, because it's like, you just like to think they're just in flight and they're coming. Um, but what we did is we, um, and again, it was like, you know, when, when I asked the question, I, I did this as a project I led internally, I asked the question if, um, you know, we wanted to fully digitize our offers, digital, accept, digital offer, digital acceptance, okay? Um, and I was told no. I was told no, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not something that can be done, different employment legislation, you can do it in this country, you can do it in that country, but it's not, you know. And then as I said, well, that's not really good enough, let's keep going at this and pushing back on the legal team. And then looking at the risk where, you know, in some countries, the risk is like a $10 fine, like for, for, for the, the kind of breaches and stuff. And so you're kind of like, okay, well, you know, cost X amount to process these things anyway. But the offer letter process itself of us not, before we, 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 we fired out digitally, and then had an E accept where it came back. That process can be done within an hour or two of verbally offering the candidate a role. What used to happen is we used to create the offer, e uh, mail it out from one location to all locations within Europe. The candidate would sign it and return it, and then we would mark them off as an accepted candidate. On average, that took nine days. Right? So we are now securing the candidates in terms of the, them emotionally connecting with us as an organization a lot sooner. The other, the other thing, that, the kind of secondary point around technology is more inwardly focused. So internal mobility is the most untapped uh, opportunity for heads of recruitment, and a, a lot because uh, organizations separate their recruitment teams from internal mobility, and it sits in a different part of HR, it's the manager's responsibility, or it's the employee's responsibility. But you've got to create the, the platform to understand what you already have, because that is the easiest way to fulfill a role, is to move talent around the organization. And what you've got to create, use technology to do, is create a platform where you actually understand your organization. I look after recruitment for engineering globally, as I said, so all in Amir and APJC, and then in the US. Our engineering organization is 26,000 FTE, just in engineering in our, in, in our organization. There is not any manager in that organization that probably even understands what ten percent of what the talent is in that total organization in terms of the, in terms of the, the tangible skills of that organization. So we are missing a massive opportunity if we're recruiting in silos and just saying, okay, we need uh, Java developers in Tel Aviv. Do we have Java developers in Tel Aviv? We don't know that. But if we've created a platform where the employee can tell us that actually I've been learning Java for the last three years, whilst I don't do Java at work, I actually know Java. And then we've got a platform where they can enter that and almost create a, a, a real time uh, uh, profile for us to be able to understand the talent. So the first place we go is, okay, we have a Java job, we have somebody that, that, that writes in Java that's looking for a job to, to write Java, so they're probably gonna leave us, um, but there's no opportunity because the bit they sit in writes C++ and Python, right? So bringing those things together um, is a huge opportunity, and technology is a huge part of that solution, creating this, this, uh, this internal, uh, the, the, this capability to move, move the talent around internally. And then the third piece where I think there's a real opportunity is slightly, uh, slightly more out there, and we, we, we talked about this uh, a couple of days ago on the phone, um, is the idea of shifting the, the, the thinking of the market and actually starting to think about talent in a different way. And it, it really ties in with what we were talking about, about the gig economy, um, is if you look at what we have in the workplace right now, we have five generations in the workplace, and possibly that's possibly going to continue on. And if you look at the expectations of the generations, it's really different. So we were talking before about the benefits. So one of the things that we're looking at doing is bringing in uh, differentiated benefits, depending on what point you are in your life, whether you want. Like, you know, you know, if you're you know, fresh out of college, you probably want to maximize the cash as opposed to pushing a load into your pension that you might want to do further, further down the line. You may not, but, but what we do is we give differentiated benefits depending on which phase of your career you're in, because we have these five generations. But the expectation is different. You don't see many of the earlier generations in the workplace thinking that they're going to go from mailroom attendant to CEO. It doesn't happen anymore. They don't think like that anymore. The, the, life, the, the way they view their life is much more transient. It's much less around, uh, they, they need to be um, self-actualization. They need to have this sense of fulfillment. They need to view their work life as a project, not their life. And so therefore, you know, what we need to get comfortable with the idea is that we need to create a platform that allows our talent to be transient. I, you know, in, in theory, wouldn't it be fantastic if all the technology companies effectively had, had a stake in the talent that was there and we were able to rotate it in and out of our organizations? We see fair. Nothing is defined as a, you've signed a contract with me, so I own you. 
you know, it, but actually, you know, can you do this project? Oh, uh, you've got this other project going on with, uh, with Google, and you know, that, that there's, no, there, there's no conflict there, and then we can allow that to happen, or we can pull you in for three months, and then there's a project that requires your skills in another organization. So we're kind of removing the barriers to say that you're our employee, and we own you, and this is, this is a defined space for us, but actually creating um, a, a, what we call almost like a, tal a cloud of talent, like a talent cloud, where talent exists within that and can be moved around uh, a lot more fluidly. So I think within all of that, I mean, that's got to be solution through technology because how do we know who's doing what, where and when? Um, but maybe a little bit more uh, progressive around that thinking as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to kind of move on to the next topic for the sake of time, but we no can problem. chat further about Day that later on. So you thank you. put the clock here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. No, it's great. Okay, so Tim, you're up. This is a question for you. So it's really about employee engagement. And employee engagement is something that's very near and dear to my heart. So I absolutely love this topic. Um, but what we're finding is that with all of the change that's going on um, around us at such a quick pace, this is actually, um, it's stressing out some of employees. It's making them fatigued. And if you look at the research, it says that some of the employees are actually less productive as a result of all this change. So what are the available tools or what can we use to implement to um, take away from the disruption and embrace change and get the most engagement for our employees? So if I'd have sat here two years ago, yeah. I'd have been sat here as the Group HR Director of Pentland Brands. And at that stage, Pentland was top 10 great place to work, UK, top 20 great place to work, Europe. And so Pentland, I think Berkhouse, Lacoste, Ted Baker, Sweden, et cetera. And then prior to that, I was HR director of Diesel, and you know we did the same work in terms of right. How do you create that? Two years later, I sit here running a small business, um, consultancy called Start of Thinking, and so I've seen it at the global level and at this micro level. And then also through working through a whole range of different organizations, different sectors, um, you then see how we try to put up these barriers. That's exactly what we've been talking about, saying that you can't cross over between construction and professional services or from retail into healthcare. You just stay in your box because we know what you're doing there. You know, just, just do what you're told. Whereas actually, there's so, so many skills and capabilities that then take us beyond those. And how do, we collect, how do we collect that information and how do we really engage people? So they bring all of their energy, their experience, their motivation into any situation. Um, I've got an Im image in my head from, from last weekend. My, my grandmother is 105 and I took my... Bless her. Bless her, yeah. And I took my seven-year-old to, uh, uh, to, uh, to go and visit. And um, so almost a hundred years between these two. And in that moment of, it wasn't very long that, that, that they spoke, you know, you, you, visiting times are fairly short when you're 105, right? Um, but the nature of, of humanity in terms of their, their curiosity, their immediate social relatedness, their want, their want to connect and to share, was a media. Um, and at the center of it is a wonderful little piece of tech called a, called a tablet. And it doesn't matter the age there, you can share photo, photographs and videos, proud stories, you know, and it's there at the center of that conversation. But it is by its nature incredibly human and very social and very engaging. And it doesn't matter about the size of our organizations, but it's about how do we enable people to be human. So at the time when we're thinking about the rise of the robots or the importance of artificial intelligence, it's even more important to focus on what makes us different. What, you know, what is it about our common humanity that is never going to be replaced by tech? It's not about so much about artificial intelligence, it's about aug augmented intelligence. How do we collate our experiences and mean that the point that we're giving advice or, con or concluding a sale, whatever it is, that we can draw on the experience of those who have gone before us so we have more information at that moment. And that might be a GP making a diagnosis, 
Uh, that might be a colleague in store making a sale. Um, it might be, a man, uh, ju uh, just think about the way that we choose to uh, buy products and services now. The whole piece online has been checked and you, know, you can track every single decision point of an individual online. But when it's face to face in store and when it's phone to phone via a call center, we don't have that clarity. But that's where the augmented intelligence is going to step into. I'll give you an example of that. Um, when we think about how we're going to communicate through organizations, we still believe that our people managers are the best connectors across the organization. So quite often we have waterfall, right? We'll flow it out in this way. But we know that that creates cold spots across the organizations where the managers haven't passed on the information or haven't followed the process that we agree that we're going to follow. And hotspots, which then creates a sense of friction, of grievance even, between different teams. Hang on, just because you've got a better boss than me doesn't mean I should be getting a, a worse deal in this organization. But actually, we can identify who the best connectors across the organizations are, the best communicators, by asking the crowd, by asking who in your team, by looking at the organizational network as it actually exists, not how we would want it to exist. And the same with individuals. We have to deal with people the way that we're actually made. And if we're changes being done to us, yeah. then what do we know? Do we go into, well, this bit, right? We go into the lizard and the dog brain because we're a bit frightened, we're unsure, we're uncertain. You haven't given, you, you, you've made me very unsure about what my future's going to be. Whereas actually, if you give me the challenge, the purpose of the organization, the purpose of the project at the start, and you ask me to contribute, then I'm here. Then I'm working uh, with all my humanity in trying to engage with the problem, come up with solutions, bring my, uh, bring my experience, work with those I, that I can collaborate with inside and outside the organization to solve the problem that we're facing together. Yeah. That makes me the best collaborator. So you know, it was really interesting reading this report because in, in order to so much talking about the human emotion that change can create. But that's because actually we're not dealing with the humanity of the teams that are going through this speed of change. And one of the points that was raised was about the importance of reward. Now, of course, reward, it's a, again understanding how we work as human beings, then, you know, yeah, I can have that chocolate bar now. And I want to get that wonderful hit from it. But the joy of that is going to burn off really quite quickly, though it might sit here for a while, right? And it's a bit like that with, with reward. We're going to get that amazing hit, but it's not going to sustain us. Whereas if we create environments in which we have really clear purpose, great communication in terms of bringing ideas up and passing information through, through the organization, we're clear as to how we work with each of the stakeholders across the organization. So in terms of um, the partners through whom we work, without whom we will not survive as an organization. Um, in terms of uh, how we work with our customers and their feedback as to how we value us. Um, and feeding that information back to our investors who are going to be focused on the leading indicators of success, not the lagging ones, not just the money we put in the bank yesterday. They want to know what our NPS scores are, what our employee engagement scores are. Um, how many, le how many um, leaders we have ready to progress into uh, tomorrow's roles, what research and development dollar we've spent. So therefore we show the strength and resilience of our business for tomorrow. And at a time when our products and services are, regardless of our best efforts, pretty close to our competitors, we have to be clear what our point of difference is. And I would argue that that is our organizational <coughs> culture because that cannot be copied with any immediate effect. Whereas you know that as soon as you bring out a new product, there will, there will be a facsimile of that very, very quickly. But not in the way you work in your organizations. That is incredibly difficult to copy. And that is where you, f you can feel that across an organization and map it out very, very quickly. So I think through that focus on organizational culture, how we show up, how we collaborate, how we work on the challenges that we have, 
we then mean that we can act with our full humanity and really engage on the performance of the organization. Totally agree. Excellent. So our final topic is one that we have to address. It's about Brexit, right? So what debate would be you know, handled without a Brexit conversation? So um, I guess, Perry, maybe we'll start with you on this one. Yeah, and I think I'll, I'll build on what Tim's just talked about. I mean, I don't even like to say the word. That's just where I'm at, right? So I call it exiting the EU because I just, you know, it, it's the portmanteau that just finished portmanteaus for me. So, um, but anyway, so uh, I'll build on what Tim said there because there, there's something, isn't there, in the employee-employer relationship, and, and you know I've talked about it, and, and we've all touched on it really, which is that uh, you know it isn't just about this um, asset thing. So if a company's annual report says employees, you know, people are our greatest, greatest asset, I think they're missing the trick because they're calling them an asset for a start. Uh, and you're not an asset, you are the company. The company is a fiction, organisations are a fiction, they're not real, they're, there's nothing real about them, we're real, okay? So let's start with that point. And if we're real and we are worried about what this piece of legislation is gonna mean to us and this kind of whole going it alone thing is gonna mean to us, we need to rely on things that are real. And one of the things I think we can do is look at the workplace as a place where realness happens, where people really care about you as an, as an individual and, and can create some sanctity and some meaning and some purpose and something to hold on to when everything else is doubtful and, and, and chaotic. So I think we should overplay now that kind of psychological thing that we can create from work. A place to turn up to, a routine, a regularity, people around me who I know and I trust and I can believe in. I think it's time to amplify those now. So if, if, you know, if people were playing at employee engagement in the past by saying, well, everybody else surveys, so we ought to do it as well, so that at least we've seen to be doing the right thing. Now's the time to stop faking it. Now's the time to say, what matters to you and what can we do to create a place of safety and sanctuary so that you don't have to face this alone? I think that's genuinely where we've got an offer. And if, employees are sh if employers are showing up like that, I think that bond of trust will start to become a strengthened one between their workers and themselves. Excellent. Good. Okay. Who wants to elaborate? Yeah, no, it's interesting just to build on what you said actually around, around the trust piece. So obviously from uh, the, the, in, the inside, you know, I have a, a team that work for me in the UK. I, I, I sit on the UK country leadership board. I'm a site leader for one of our offices in the UK. Um, and it's a big question, and I think one of the things that, that, that we've got to deal with as, a, as an organization is the uncertainty. But I think one of the things we also need to do as an organization is be more mature and trust that our employees um, are going to have some level of understanding of what we're going through as an organization. That's where this, this whole idea of an enge a team engagement really plays out. Because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't say to my team, everything's going to be okay. I equally don't say everything's going to be a load of crap. I just say, you know, we take it as we come. There are some challenges. You know, I, you know, we, uh, we live in a, in a, in a, in a dollar economy within, within our organization. Um, so when you have, um, you know, a depreciation of a, of a currency against the dollar, um, you know, it's, it's a big problem. In the UK, it's a problem. Any organization that reports to the US in dollars uh, from the UK probably has to do 20, 25% more revenue this year just to stand still because of the FX is going to work against them. And so, you know, it, it, that's, not, that's not a good experience for salespeople who are seeing, you know, a, a hike in expectation um, just to stand still from a, a revenue perspective by the time you convert back to dollars. Um, so I think there is something in this, this whole kind of cultural evolution of companies around the transparency, removing the master and slave mentality, removing the, 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 the hierarchy and the, 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 the perceived barriers towards having these conversations. And just, you know, kind of co-owning the problem and, and, and co-owning the solutioning of it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no, you know, I don't, I don't have an expectation that, that, that any, of, uh, any of the more senior leaders than me in any of the regions are, are, are going to give me what the answer is for my organization. But what I do is I look at it and I, I, I gather sentiment from my team um, and we figure out how we, how we feel this is going to impact us and we move forward and we, we either do it aggressively or we do it tentatively dependent on the context. So I think a large part of this is around transparency and, and being prepared to say to your organization, listen, I, I just don't know. Like it's, you know, it's a journey. And I yeah, because I think the danger in these situations are yeah. sort of, you know, generally over communication because, you know, we, we, it, it will be a long, arduous journey on the whole Brexit situation. I think about 
And it's, it is around the right level of communication. And you know, I think about the whole immigration piece and the different way that clients have dealt with it that we work with. And some have just said, we don't want to get involved in it, we'll just leave it. And how much, how much support do we want to give? We don't want to be seen as over committing to those that are EU citizens working in here. Whereas other clients have absolutely embraced it and got work, workshops going and, and really have tailored. So they're really identifying what the issues are coming out, identifiable issues coming out of Brexit now, which are going to concern different, different sections of their work community and actually addressing it and it, it's it, it's actually really interesting to see what a difference that is making specificity around it the right level of communication has been interesting for us can i also just add that i really hope we don't see a glut of brexit policies inside organizations because i think i think we need another policy like a hole in the head do you know what i mean i think i really hope that people take it as you said a mature adult cooperative collaborative approach to this and just say look we're all in it together you know this is perhaps the one thing that might bring leaders out the boardroom and people from the front line together to go how do we make this work then I think that's that's what I hope but let's not have a policy on it I think because we do do some odd things in organizations I mean you know we party when people leave yeah right? you know it's just, that's that's like bonkers yeah. isn't it it's just a case of not when they join yeah. no 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 no, no. It's a case of when right, you yeah. join that's when it's really at its worst because you know you, you know it's a case of you, you're not set <laughs> up great. right you know, you're not set up right you haven't got the right information you haven't got the right kits no 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 let's let's, let's throw the really big party when you go and that's when we'll tell you you're really good by the way and that we're going to miss you so they say we do do weird things <laughs> you know we, you know we, we make an entire in industry out of literally putting people in boxes i mean that's quite impressive you know it, it, it's uh, seeing we've just talked about the importance of breaking down we're in the top right hand box and that's really good i'm going to tell you why so this is an opportunity to really have an adult to adult conversation about you know this is what this is what's going on we haven't got the answers but let's you know let's let's open it up and there are some really tough conversations I've spent most of you know most of my working life in in, in on you know shoes and shoes and footballs and jeans all of that stuff is coming into Southampton docks you know then going into uh, distribution centers in the UK and then going across uh, the uh, the rest of the EU that's not going to happen anymore. So that will be now coming across and going into uh, uh, the Netherlands or whatever. So it's about having those really tough conversations about this is the outcome in this industry and this is how we're going to be thinking it through. You know, what is this going to mean for us in this organisation? Mm. So we've got a few minutes left, not a tremendous amount of time, but enough time that we should be able to take a question or two from the audience and thereafter we've got an opportunity to network and converse so you don't have to run out. So I'd like to see who would be interested to ask the first question. Um, this one's for Perry. Hi. Um, I think it's been touched on already a bit, but everywhere in the news you see it talks about automation, replacing yep. people for work. Yep. And I wondered how you'd say, how should HRs approach this uh, when talking to their employees, how to approach the fear that yeah. surrounds it and the yeah. kind of anxiety I think that yeah. people feel. So in the world we're in, the genie's out of the bottle anyway, so it's more likely that somebody from the workforce is going to knock on HR's door and say, I've seen this Oxford University report that says 47% of jobs are going to be automated or robotically delivered, so am I in the 47? Do I need to be worried? That's more likely to happen. So, so what I'd like to think is that within HR we can prompt that. We can actually be the ones who are taking in those kind of things and saying, you know, here's some stuff that's interesting that's going on in the world of work and make it good to talk about it. So, you know... Put it in the open. Don't, don't get caught out by it. So that's the starting point. Um, and then all these things are going to take experimentation and all sorts of lead times and whatever. So, so the idea there is to, again, be HR up front and say, look, we are looking at automation because we've found some brilliant chatbots that might take away some of the dirge from your work. And then we can work with you to design something that makes better use of your talent in the first place. And I'll tell you why. So there was a story I heard yesterday. There was an experiment done on executive coaching. And they had three options. They could talk to a real coach in person, they could talk to a real coach by messaging, or they could talk to a chatbot. Now they tried all three, guess what they liked best? The chatbot. Because the chatbot didn't have an attitude. The chatbot didn't, they weren't worried what the chatbot thought about them. 
all sorts of things go in. So, so let's not run away from technology. Let's be sensible about how we design it in. And the only way you do that is you say to people, it's not taboo. Let's all play around with this stuff to get it right. And HR's in, in the thick of that and at the front of it. That's what I'd say anyway. The other thing I would just, sorry, just add to that is if you go even further down, and we, we touched on this on the phone, as, as organizations, we really need to start influencing what the schools are doing and yeah. what the universities are doing. Because my kids are learning German and French. I have no idea why. Everybody I've ever met in the business world in France or Germany speaks good enough English for me to converse. My kids should be learning Java and C++ and Python and working towards a universal language, which is coding, not what they're doing now. So I think there needs to be a lot more pressure from companies to dictate that uh, academia and universities and schools need to start preparing for the workforce for the future. Because we are not going to need what they're teaching right now, I can tell you that. There's a question in the back. Sorry. Hi, when we talked about the gig economy, you were talking, mentioned IR35. Um, how do you think the recent changes into public sector contractors is going to affect the, the way that things are going in the freelancing and contracting world? Um, yeah, no, I'm glad you raised the question about IR35 because, and as you say, it's directed at the public sector. And so the debate we were having as employment lawyers, how exciting that with our tax team is whether it's going to go into the private sector. So, um, and the, the viewpoint, so from purely from the moving to the private sector, the viewpoint is that actually it likely won't move into the private sector. Um, and so from that perspective, people feel pretty comfortable. In terms of, of the public sector, again, it's, you, can see, you can see why it's coming into play. Um, to me, it's all about the government trying to get more money into the treasury. This is all about solving a debt issue um, because that's what IR35 is about. IR35 is about protecting people being able to um, get more money in their pockets. So I am a cynic, I'm afraid, and I think it's about the government trying to get more money into the treasury, which I can understand, but it is, but it is about that. But it will, uh, but it will affect because IR35, like the Netherlands, is a way of like what they have in the Netherlands is a way of people knowing that this is what's how their money is going to be treated. So I think that uncertainty will will have effects because basically um, companies are always going to be concerned about their tax exposure and whether it be public sector or private sector. So I think it will discourage um, that ability to, to work in this particular way. I think we will be moving down the, the French and the German models because it's just too hard. Regulation, again, this is what we're talking about all the time, regulation, and this is all about money. And the impact on talent will be very interesting because if you've got the opportunity at the moment to do work in the UK or in the States, because of what we've been talking about in terms of FX. You know, personally, I've been spending about a quarter of my time in the States recently. There is a very logical reason for that. And then talent then deciding that actually that's more difficult for me to work in the public sector. I'll, I'll, I'll do all my work in private sector. Unfortunately, then you don't get the movement of ideas around. So through that regulation, you can have some very unintended consequences in terms of how talent will then, then choose to spend their time. No, I agree, and particularly with us Brexiting as well. Sorry. Sorry. I know, I can't bear to say the word either. Um, you know, not that, not that our law firm has an opinion on Brexit. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think you are going to see the war for talent becoming, you know, people are going to be going wherever they can make the, you know, money is yeah. the, one of the main reasons we work, let's be clear. Subject to employee engagement, obviously. <laughs> so we have time for one final question. I wanted to ask a question for Perry and yep. Kevin, and it's, it's on the subject of automation again. Yep. Um, yeah, there's lots and lots of automation happening in the recruitment space, lots of apps coming out. Um, LinkedIn, Facebook are trying to do, uh, Facebook's moving into that area increasingly as well. So my question is, where, does, where do you think the automation process ends at the moment? And if you're going to, if you set up a recruitment business, how would you do it in the sense that you're sort of future-proofing it? So you're doing a job that will, that's likely not going to get automated, so you're always servicing those clients uh, and performing a service that's always going to resonate with them. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can have a first start. So um, it, it, as I said before, it's the constant debate around when to automate, when not to automate from a recruitment in-house recruitment perspective and and as I said you know I know people uh, are very large technology companies that want to fully automate end-to-end -end. Um, I don't see that as being 
the right strategy right now as opposed to taking elements of, of the process. But you're right the, 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 that it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you saw, and, and that, that, that was really based on your question, that Google last week announced that there's Google Jobs has come in. Uh, like you, Google go into anything, they change a the market. Like there is no doubt. Like the the scale at which they they operate. I mean, if you if you use Google Flights, you know it does what Sky Scanner doesn't do. Is it'll search every airline irrespective of where they whether they pay a kickback or not. Um, so so there's all of a sudden it, it's creating this um, this real globalization and, and, and breaking down the barriers um, at which you uh, you, you you can uh, identify and attract. Um, what it does mean is that you maybe need to position yourself a little bit different. I mean, for a, for, for a start, um, I would say that you know, there's definitely an impact to, to the ability to uh, uh, drive, drive cost out, out of the door from a recruitment company. You arguably might need to spend less on some of the, the job boards because you're, you're, if, if somebody's using Google Jobs, then it'll, it'll deliver them if they're on one in, instead of what you do at the moment is where you have to be everywhere um, to do it. Um, but what I would always say to anybody around uh, advice around setting up a, a recruitment business right now is more and more the, the organizations have gone in-house right over the years. I went in quite early. I went in about 12 years ago, um, maybe even longer, 14 years ago. More and more organizations have done that. Uh, and even uh, smaller organizations um, have somebody who's responsible for recruitment. It just used to be a bolt onto a part of HR years ago. So what I would always say is, where we look to go outside, we always try and do what's economically viable in-house. So we, we don't push stuff that we would do at scale in-house. What we do go out is where it's no longer economically viable, where we will never re reutilize that pipeline in the next 10 years. It's a role that we very, really high for. It's a very niche role. It's something that's very specific to a location. Um, so what I would what, what I would say in terms of the in, in terms of the whole automation piece is, is don't go after the scale because that's what I'm doing. You don't need to compete with me for you know, a certain job in in in, in Bedford Lakes out in Heathrow, or you know, because we have a, a such a strong fulfillment engine around around that piece. Um, I, I would try and attach yourself to the niche and the automation around the niche piece and creating that connectivity that I don't have and I don't I can't invest in because I'm solving for eighty percent. I'm not solving for twenty percent. So I'll just add to that with a perhaps more controversial longer term view on it. Uh, and that's that I think jobs are going to be in decline, but an experience of work will be in an increase. And what I mean by that is let's just look at the media, right? Who honestly dives into Google and starts searching for the news? You don't. It comes at you. So what I think is going to happen in the future, there'll be algorithms, there'll be automation that will say, I know how skillful you are. I know what time you've got on your hands. I know whereabouts you are. I know all sorts of things about you. And here's some some work that you might want to do and when we can do that it challenges the entire orthodoxy of what a job is even in the first place so you might think ah oh, this guy's talking out the back of his head here but genuinely jobs and work are going to be disaggregated so we won't recruit like we used to because those things that are called jobs are a kind of 20th century technology and we're heading into something that we've not come across before, a total disaggregation of the market. So automation will do a very, very different thing there. It will help you find work. That's where I think we're headed. Uh, and on that note, I'll probably leave you with a kind of controversy, won't I? And uh, I, would, I would just say <laughs> the roles that are coming, uh, roles not jobs, is that, is that, nice. is that okay? I like what you did um, there. <laughs> are going to be... I mean, you know, my seven-year-old, right? The one who's good with his granny, great granny. Um, you know, he's going to be a vlogger. He's really clear, Dad, I want to be a vlogger. I want to, I, I want to be like Stampy. Uh, for the parents in the room will know about Stampy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, I, I get the nods, but I'll explain to anybody else afterwards. Um, and, you know, that's his concept of what work is, right? I want, I, w I want to do that. And what's interesting is that the bleeding edge of all of this, we're creating new ways of working. I'll say a very, very quick final thought. Okay, good. Um, so on the International Space Station, uh, two, two uh, Japanese uh, astronauts went up. And with them, they, were, they sent a little robot. It's about 18 inches tall. It's called Korobo. And uh, Korobo went up. And it was really important for their, um, for their uh, whole experience that he was there chatting to them, making sure they're OK, whole, whole part of the experience. They finished their stay, they went down, they left Krobo behind. Krobo got very sad because he was lonely. And so they had to arrange for Krobo to go back down on the next shuttle. So jobs of the future, AI welfare. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much. So. Um, 
I'd like to thank, first of all, Sam. Thank you for arranging a magnificent event. So well done to you and the team that supports her. It's very comfortable thanking you in public. I can see that works well for you. Uh, but then uh, thank you very much to the four of you. I know a lot of time, energy, information. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And then, of course, thank you to all of you for coming and showing your support. So please stick around. We'll be networking, having another drink, and everyone would love to speak with you further. So enjoy the rest of the day and the sunshine. Thank you.